Hey, Pastor Brennan here. I just want to say thank you for viewing this video sermon. I hope that you're blessed. If you're tied into a local church and you're viewing this as just sort of extra teaching, that's awesome. I hope you really enjoy it and that you grow spiritually. If you're not tied into a local church, I just want to encourage you to come and maybe visit Crosspoint in person or check out another Christ-centered, gospel-proclaiming church in your area because we believe that everyone should experience the blessing of being tied into a local church. But I hope this video is an encouragement and that it helps you grow in your affections for Jesus Christ. Many Christians today are traveling down the river of doubt. Its dark current pulls us into uncertainty where we have more questions than answers. Questions we're not supposed to ask in church. Can I still believe the creation story? Do I need a more progressive Christianity? Is God guilty of genocide? Can I still be a Christian if Christians ignore injustice? Many Christians are deconstructing their faith, and some are even deconverting. While we all have doubts, doubt is a part of faith. When the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus, Matthew 28 says they worshiped him, but some doubted. Amid their doubts, they clung to Christ, and God used them to change the world. In fact, God designed our doubts to take us deeper into our faith. So let's journey down the river of doubt together. Good morning, church. Today's sermon text is found in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, and it's on page 996 in the church Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. Now, if you're able, please stand for the reading of the word. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, 996 in the church Bibles. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Sorry. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for, for Demas, in love with, his, with this present world, has deserted me and gone up to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone up to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Ahmed. Good morning, everyone. Remember Rhett and Link? Earlier in the River of Doubt series, I shared the story of these NC State crew missionaries turned YouTube sensations who later deconstructed their faith and walked away from Christianity. After sharing their deconstruction story on their enormously popular YouTube channel, Rhett and Link became the poster boys for not only spiritual deconstruction, but deconversion from Christianity altogether. And it actually prompted one of you here from Crosspoint to ask this question. So you must feel pretty good because they're devoting the whole sermon to your question. All right, sound good? Here's the question. It seems that eternal security is a huge doctrine at this church. So if someone deconstructs their faith, as in turns away from God, like Rhett and Link, do you believe they still go to heaven? They were missionaries. Then later, they rejected God. I always get the standard answer, well, then they weren't true Christians. Obviously, they were when in ministry, so do they still go to heaven? Let me just say, this is an excellent question, and I want to thank whoever submitted this question, because I think this is a question that's on many people's minds. In fact, it's sort of the underlying tension that encapsulates the whole sermon series, right? I mean, we're talking about people inside the church deconstructing their faith and walking away from Christianity. So this is an excellent question. How can a confessing Christian Someone who says they put their hope, their trust, their faith in Jesus Christ, embraced him, not only as their only savior, but the Lord over their life. And then they turn around and leave the whole thing behind. How can this be? Perhaps it's even led some of you to ask yourself over the past couple of months, how do I know I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and still be a Christian? I got to a point in preparing for this sermon series 
where I had to stop listening to Rhett and Link. Because you get to a place where you're saying, hey, I got to guard myself. I don't want to continue to immerse myself in this and go down this path. You know, it makes me think of the great hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Remember that line? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So we must remember, as we try to process and understand what happened with Rhett and Link, as you're processing and trying to understand what has happened to your children or your grandchildren or the people who used to study the Bible with you at your kitchen table but have walked away, we need to remind ourselves that Rhett and Link are actually not the first people to walk away from the church. It is so important to understand that. For the last 2,000 years, people who were in the church have been walking away from the church. In fact, in today's text, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see that Paul's co-worker, a man named Demas, he walked away. He walked away from Christianity. So our task today in this shorter sermon before our Q&A, the task is, what does the Bible have to say about this idea of eternal security? If you're not familiar with that theological term, eternal security is this idea that once someone has professed true faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has regenerated them, they have been born again to faith in Jesus Christ, is their salvation eternally secure? That's the question that we want to ask. And I want to affirm the person who asked the question because you've been paying attention. Yes, guilty as charged, eternal security is a huge doctrine at Crosspoint. But let me tell you, and I want to show you that it's a huge doctrine at Crosspoint because it's a huge doctrine in the Bible. It's a huge doctrine to the Lord. That's why it's a huge doctrine here. Before we go any further, let's ask for the Lord's help as we dive into his word. Would you pray with me? Lord God of the universe, as we open your word, we ask that you would open our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. You have charted a course for us to head into some deep theological waters, Lord, to unpack this this idea of eternal security and its cousin doctrine, the perseverance of the saints. So Lord, we ask that you would give us understanding for our good, and for your glory. But ultimately, Lord, would you help us to go deeper into the gospel? Help us to understand the nature of the gospel, the essence of the gospel. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, when, uh, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, he's an old man. He's an old man who's been in prison for his faith, and in fact, he's literally on trial for his life. He's amid a court case And he is writing this letter to his young protege, Timothy, to figuratively pass the torch of church planting in the Roman Empire. This is a special moment. This old man, he's passing the torch to this young man, Timothy. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and uh, reach underneath the seat in front of you. Do me a favor, grab a copy of God's Word, one of these books right here, and you can meet me on page 996. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to be picking up in verse 7. Now, as you're handling this book, just a friendly reminder, this book is not merely a book. This book is the inspired word of God. God Almighty has delivered his word to us in a book. And in a culture that has subjectivized truth, this book is the undisputed heavyweight champion of truth. And we like to say this book is spiritual dynamite. It has the power to radically transform our lives because in this book is the one who transforms. His name is Jesus. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 4, picking up in verse 7, page 996 in a church Bible. Hear the word of the Lord through the Apostle Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for or because Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Well, this begs the question, who on earth is Demas, and why should we care that he ditched Paul? This is actually not the only place in the Bible where Demas is mentioned. 
Paul mentions him. He gives him a shout out in Colossians chapter 4, 14. He also gives him a shout out at the end of his letter to Philemon. I want to read that verse to you right now. This is what Paul writes. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So watch this. Demas served alongside the greatest missionary in the history of the church, and he was rubbing elbows with two gospel writers, the guy who wrote the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Luke. They are his colleagues. He's doing ministry with them, and it's evident that he has a fruitful ministry. So that begs the question, what happened? How did this man walk away? Paul doesn't give us details, right? He doesn't give us a lot of details, but it appears that Demas didn't merely leave Paul in the lurch. He didn't merely walk away from Paul, but he walked away from his ministry. And I believe the text is inferring he walked away from Christianity. If you look at verse 8, Paul specifies that all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, they will receive the crown of righteousness. And then in verse 10, he specifies that Demas, rather than being in love with Christ, is in love with the world. I believe Paul is communicating to us that he's not merely walked away and deserted Paul, but he has walked away from Christianity altogether. Man, that's, that's just, face it, that's scary, isn't it? I mean, that's crazy. It looks like Demas deconstructed and deconverted from Christianity. How can this be? He's a missionary. He has a fruitful ministry. It reminds me of Rhett and Link, doesn't it? You know who else it reminds me of? Judas Iscariot. For almost three years, Judas lived with Jesus traveled with Jesus, did ministry with Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, it tells us that Judas was among the disciples when Jesus sent them out who was performing miracles in the name of Jesus. And then he betrayed him. He walked away, and Jesus leaves no doubt. He specifically tells us that Satan entered in to Judas. Judas was never a believer to begin with. And yet he had a fruitful ministry. He performed miracles in the name of Jesus Christ. But you know what? It's not just people in the Bible 2,000 years ago. We know people who have walked away. This isn't theoretical. It's not merely theological. It's deeply personal, isn't it? And it feels shocking, doesn't it? We feel blindsided when someone we've been in church with, someone we've been do, done ministry with, they walk away. It's shocking, but it shouldn't be. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7? Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Namely, did we not perform miracles in your name, Jesus? And then I, Jesus, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's tough. That's profoundly difficult. And it begs the question, not just about eternal security, but it begs the question, what is salvation? What is the essence of salvation? What is the nature of salvation? How does salvation come about in the life of a believer? How does this work? How do we process and make sense of this? So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and buckle up, reach underneath your seat for a seatbelt, buckle up, because we're going to do some systematic theology, and we're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about this question. What is the nature? What is the essence of of salvation and how can it help us make sense and understand what not only happened to Demas, but what happened to Rhett and Link and maybe others that we know personally. All right, so let's go ahead and get after it here. We're going to start in the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9. This is the end of Jonah's prayer. He's crying out to God from the belly of a fish. If that's blowing your mind right now, come on September 29th when we start preaching through the book of Jonah. 
All right, but this is what Jonah says. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to God, not us. Salvation is something that God does. It's not something that we do. We have to be constantly reminded in a culture of entitlement that the only thing that we were entitled to was the wrath of God. God owed us nothing but his condemnation and judgment, and yet he's given us everything in his son Jesus. The Bible reminds us Christians who we once were. We were dead in our sin dead in our sin, without hope in the world, cut off from God. We could not move toward God. We did not have the spiritual resources to wash ourselves clean of sin, did not have the spiritual resources to save ourselves or even move towards God. So what did God do? He moved towards us in his son, Jesus Christ. That is the God of the Bible. And who is Jesus? He's the eternal son of God, a member of the Trinity, the Godhead. He didn't just come into existence in Mary's womb. He has existed for all eternity. And he is the only perfect one. And the perfect one came and died to perfect imperfect people like me and you. That's the hope of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the perfect one, went to the cross to suffer the penalty not for his sin, because he had none, but the penalty of our sins. And the cross is mind-blowing because God himself was willing to pay the price for our sin. God absorbed the wrath of God. That's the hope of the gospel. And since Jesus was punished for our sin, we can be forgiven, we can be justified, we can be reconciled to our creator, adopted into his family, holy by grace, received through faith. That's the hope of the gospel. Paul puts it this way in Titus 3, verse 5. He says, he saved us. Not because of our righteous works, but because of his mercy. But because of his mercy. Salvation is a gift from God. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. That's what makes it a gift of grace. God extends it to us by grace. We receive it by faith. The Apostle Paul, he writes in Ephesians chapter 1, brace yourself. He says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He continues and he says, and he predestined us for adoption in Christ into the family of God. Now, we don't have time to plumb the depths of the doctrine of predestination this morning, believe it or not. But at a minimum, we can recognize that salvation is not random. It's not accidental. It's not incidental. But salvation is providential. God is sovereign over every molecule and every atom in the universe. And the Bible says that God is also sovereign over salvation itself. That's not what Brennan is saying. That's what the Bible is saying. If we continue now, we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 30, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. He also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, oh, he also glorified. He also glorified. So track with Paul's logic. He says, those who were predestined, those whose names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world, Those who he predestined, he also called. This is the effectual call of God. What does it look like? We get a picture of it in John 11. There's a dead man in a tomb, and Jesus stands outside the tomb. The guy's been rotting for four days, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. That is the effectual power of the word of God. He called him by name, and a dead man was raised to life. That is the call of God. So when God calls someone by name, a person who is spiritually dead according to the scriptures, a person who does not have a heart that can feel and experience the grace of God, someone who is spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, and yet the call of God goes forth. Angela Tavares, come forth! And a spiritually dead woman 
is raised, is resuscitated to new spiritual life. That is the power of the call of God. And those whom he called, he also justified. What does it mean to be justified in the eyes of God? It means to be declared righteous, to be declared innocent, to be wrapped in the perfect, bulletproof righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is justification. And you ready for this one? And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification is the final glorious act of salvation. Glorification is referring to a future reality where Christ returns to reign over a new heavens and a new earth, and he will raise every believer up. He will give us a new resurrected body. And the scriptures say that we will reign and rule with Christ for eternity. That is our glorification, and it is guaranteed in Christ. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he will glorify. That is a blood-bought promise of our God. In John 10, Jesus is debating with the Pharisees. And he says this, my sheep, he's referring to his people. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Do you hear what Christ is saying? It is glorious. When God called Angela to himself, he placed her into his son's hand, and Jesus says, no one who the Father has given me, nobody, not even Satan himself, can snatch them out. So the question isn't, can I hold on to Christ? The question is, will Christ hold on to me? And Jesus said in John 10, nobody can snatch them out of my hands. Those whom the Father gives to the Son, they have eternal life. They will never perish. So I believe the operative question for us today is not, can a believer lose his or her salvation? But the real question is, can God lose us? Can the father disown one of his children who have been purchased and brought into the family by the blood of Jesus Christ? We look to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You've got to keep reading the Bible even when you can't pronounce the books. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep plowing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes this. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify that is purify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. He who calls you is faithful. And then don't miss the end. Paul says, he will surely do it. He will surely do it. God does not leave any man, woman, or child who is his behind. He does not leave anyone behind. Jeremiah chapter 32. We see this reality in the Old Testament. The prophet Jeremiah, he says this, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. This is the promise. This is the mind-blowing reality of the gospel. God gives us a new heart. He takes out the heart of stone. He inserts a heart of flesh. He gives us a new heart, an everlasting covenant, a blood-bought promise signed by Jesus Christ with his own blood. This is the everlasting covenant we have in Jesus Christ. And we are promised that he will never, never turn away from us. And this is what is so beautiful. He promises that he will never let us fully turn away from him. Ultimately, it's not up to me and my power to persevere. It's up to God and his grace to cling to me even when I'm too weak to cling to him. That's the beauty of eternal security, brothers and sisters. Remember, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of me, it's not of you. Salvation is of the Lord. And the one who has the power to save us has the power to keep us. Those whom God calls, he keeps. He keeps us blameless in his sight for all eternity. So let me say to you, my Christian brother or sister in Christ, if you are fearful 
Will I wake up tomorrow morning and still be a Christian? If you're a blood-bought child of God, the answer is a resounding yes. A resounding yes. Not because of your hard work, your perseverance, your spiritual maturity, but because those whom God calls, he keeps. He keeps. So that's a quick tour looking at some Bible verses that point us to this glorious reality. But the question remains, how do we understand Demas? How do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of Rhett and Link and our family members and friends who have turned away from Christianity? How do we come to understand that? How do we make sense of it? Well, we keep reading the Bible. We keep reading the Bible. In 1 John chapter 2, the Apostle John writes this, He says, do not love the world. Quick pause. Remember, Paul specified that Demas loved the world. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I want you to brace yourself. That was verse 18. I'm going to share with you verse 19. I want you to emblazon this on your mind and let the Holy Spirit tattoo it on your heart. Are you ready? John, 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Let me make a quick, critical clarification here. When John says they went out from us because they were not of us, he is saying they have definitively definitively left and they never came back. And they never came back. If someone is wandering, if someone is doubting, even if someone is deconstructing, if they truly are in Christ... God is always going to bring them back. But if they leave and never come back, John is helping us understand. He says they went out from us because they were not of us. Those whom God calls, he keeps. He never leaves a man, woman, or child that is his behind. That's so important for us to understand. It's critical. So now we have to really think practically about it. Just because someone goes to church doesn't mean that they are truly part of the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And just because someone makes a profession of faith doesn't mean that it is true, eternity-changing faith in Christ. And just because someone is baptized, it will haunt me for the rest of my life. I personally discipled someone, baptized them years ago, And then they walked away. And then they walked away. Just because someone is baptized doesn't mean that they have true saving faith in Jesus Christ. They went out from us because they were not of us. This is hard. This is profoundly difficult. Did Rhett and Link fall away never to return? I don't know but God does. Did your son or daughter or granddaughter fall away never to come back or are they just drifting for a season? I don't know, but God does. So what do we do in this difficult space where it's hard to hope? What do we do? We do two things. We pray. We remember that we are not the Holy Spirit, we are not Jesus Christ, we don't have the power to save, but we can pray and call on the one who does. So we pray and we plead. We plead with our loved ones. We plead with them to come back. Come back to Christ. Come back into the family of God. Stop drifting, stop wandering. Come back. But ultimately, we entrust them to the only one who truly knows their heart and the only one who has the power to either bring them to faith in Christ if they never knew him or to bring them back 
We don't have the capacity to do it, so we cry out to the one who does. Let me leave you with this verse because I believe it instills incredible hope when we are seeing people wander away and maybe even we feel like falling away from faith. Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion in the day of Christ. He who began a good work in your son or your daughter will be faithful to bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. So when we really learn to read our Bibles well, we will probably stop asking the question, can I lose my salvation? And we'll ask the question, can God lose me? Will I let go of God? No, the better question is, will God let go of me? And the answer is a resounding, glorious no. He will never let you go. No one can snatch you out of Christ's hand. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful, glorious, wonderful doctrine of eternal security. Thank you for reminding us that salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to us. And those whom you call to yourself, those whom you regenerate by the power of your Holy Spirit, those to whom you give the gift of faith so that they can trust in Jesus Christ, you will never turn away from them. And you will make sure that ultimately they do not turn away from you. We thank you for this glorious truth. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, I pray right now for anyone here who is struggling with doubt, anyone here who's being sucked into the vortex of deconstruction, Lord, would you infuse them with hope and would your Holy Spirit draw them back to yourself? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.